Let's talk about our chemical senses. So I just combined everything into one slideshow, and so we'll just continue with this slideshow on when, on, on Monday. Um, today we're just going to talk about olfaction, and then uh, on Monday we'll we'll do gustation and flavor um, to wrap things up as far as material is concerned. So let us let us forgot what this one is. Let's see what loads. Ah, uh, yes. Smells like teen spirit. Not gonna play it, unfortunately. Not gonna play it. Just... Just so you know. But... Smells like teen spirit. Yeah. Just in case you were wondering what, um... Gyms smell like. <laughs> the smelling and the tasting. So, the smelling today... Um, and then the tasting on Monday. Okay, the smelling and the tasting. All right, so chemical senses. We're doing them last because they suck. No, they don't, but they kind of, you know. Yeah. Are they worthless? Maybe. Can they help us? Sure. Are they needed? Probably. Should we love them? Likely. I don't know. You know, it's like, it's like they have a function of keeping us alive. Um... I think that's pretty important. Okay. It's pretty important, I guess. Um, because they're considered the gatekeepers? You know, you gotta eat. If you're familiar with Central Illinois, W-E-E-K, they have a thing that's called you gotta eat, right? You gotta eat. You gotta eat. Okay. And you gotta make sure that you gotta eat the right things. Otherwise, you're dead. Please! I am not a medical professional. Do not inject or ingest disinfectant. Okay. Now that we've gotten that out of the way. Um... Good times. Yeah. So... And then also, memory and emotions are very tied. Very tied. And that's because the olfactory response goes right up into the um, hippocampus and amygdala. Pretty cool, right? Yeah. I think so. I think it's really cool. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to clip that. I'm going to clip the, uh, you know, don't ingest disinfectants thing. Just you wait. That's going to be all over social media. Yep. Uh, all right. So. Olfaction. Smelling. It's the fancy word for smelling. Olfaction. Okay. Most mammals and, like, pretty much all animals, vertebrates, um, are macrosmatic. They have a keen sense of smell. But here's the thing. Humans aren't macrosmatic. We are microsmatic. We have a decent sense of smell, but it is crap compared to every other animal out there. Um, because it is no longer crucial to our survival. Uh, and so... It kind of sucks, comparatively, right? You look at your dog, you look at your cat, and they're like, what are you sniffing over there? I can't smell anything. And they're getting, like, a, you know, chemical wafting, odorific thing in their nose, a smorgasbord of smells, and you're like, mm, it smells like life to me. And they're like, no. There's this, and there's this. It's... It's the magic. And then you're like, well, can you see as good as me? No. No, you can't see as good as me. Although, cats, you can see better at me at night. But, but, but broadly speaking, you cannot see better than me. And so, therefore, I win. But they can hear better on us. So, I, you know. What are you going to do? Sing and Bronstad. Um, showed a relationship between a man's rating 
of women body odor body body odors and uh women's menstrual strike cycles okay so this is a positive there's a positive affect for that uh this is something that is part of olfaction but for humans is not necessarily talked about all that much and it's pheromones so this is why most animals are macrosmatic because pheromones are chemicals that are produced by other animals. And generally, those pheromones contain messages for the receiver. I am ready to mate with you. That's a chemical message. Um, and humans don't really don't really use pheromones in that way anymore but it is still there and it is still subtle it is still subtle which is why there is this um this uh uh correlation between men uh and uh, uh positivity between body odors and um when a woman is going through their menstrual cycle so, even though we're microsmatic and we don't really care about pheromones, they, they are still somewhat used by our body, but to a much lesser degree than other animals. Hunter asks, is it true that dogs can smell each individual ingredient in something? Because that's, I heard how bomb dogs work. Um, I don't know about each individual ingredient, but you can train a dog to sniff out specific ingredients in things. And they'll be able to detect trace amounts of those ingredients, even when they're mixed with other things. If the chemical composition changes, though, it, it's not going to be the same odor, if that makes, if that makes sense. So, um, if they're sniffing for a particular bomb compound then the bomb compound has to maintain its integrity inside whatever wherever the bomb making process is if that makes sense but you can train dogs to um, um, sniff out particular compounds and that's what drug sniffing dogs are for and bomb sniffing dogs yeah all right, so detecting odors. Odors, odors um, are only smelled when they pass a threshold. Both, both chemical senses, so smelling and tasting, are threshold-based uh, threshold senses. So you have to achieve a certain quantity I mean, it's kind of like um, darkness and light and that ab and, and that absolute threshold. But you have to s receive the correct amount of quantity um, in both your nose and your mouth and or, bo or both uh, in order to detect it is there, okay? Um, and this is just done with a yes-no procedure. Very simple experimental task. You give people vials of odor and they waft them in front of their faces, and um, do you say yes when you detect it, and no if you don't detect it, and then some vials don't have anything, no, some vials don't have odor in them, and so those are used for control. Uh, control trials, they're called blank trials, okay? Um, but this is pretty subjective, and uh, it's difficult to know whether or not the per participant is biased in their response. So, forced choice is actually slightly better. Um, they have, they're given two trials, one with an odorant and the other one is blank. Okay, and then they're, they're, they're asked which one smelled the strongest and that way they can um, determine how much odorant by parts per million ppm is in the vial and then so that will let us know what the threshold is right and then there are some there there are some 
compounds out there that actually don't have an odor, right? So carbon monoxide is so is so deadly because it's odorless, right? And so it's this de denser than air kind of thing, and so you you have this massive amount piling up, uh, and then you you can't smell it. You have no idea it's there until you start feeling the effects of carbon monoxide poisoning. So these are obviously odorants. They these have there are receptor sites in our nose that can that can pick these up. Okay. So a little comparison here. So you know how I said that um, that most animals are macrosmotic and and we're microsmotic. Um, Asthmatic, sorry, macrosmatic and microsmatic. That's what I meant to say. Uh, rats are eight to fifty times more sensitive to odors, but but that so that's rats, right? Um, as far as experimental stuff goes, right? Doing doing neuroscience with with rat populations. Dogs are three hundred to ten thousand times more sensitive than humans are at detecting odors. They also cannot smell carbon monoxide, though. So, you know, they don't have us beat on that one. Okay. Um, but the good news is for humans is that um, though we are not as good at detecting smells as even rats or dogs, all of the receptors that we are going to talk about uh, exist on a, you know, essentially the same all or nothing principle. <clears throat> so if you get the appropriate amount of quantity of smell that you can detect, well, then you're as sensitive to that smell as a dog is with, a, with the same quantity. Okay. So, you know, they're just not as, as, as annoyed by it. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll pop the whoopee cushion in the room here, and I'll say that, uh, farts. Okay? Flatulence. Your dog does it, right? And when they fart, they seem nonplussed by it. When we fart, they're like, what did you do? It could be confounded with the sound of the fart, but, um... Generally speaking, they'll run away if, it, if it's a bad fart, right? But when they fart, and Moff Murphy dr drops the rankest of rank farts, yeah. um, he's like, yeah, it's fine. It's all good. Yeah. Um, so with the all or nothing principle in mind here, the other part of that equation is that number of receptors. So you, have you ever saw, seen a dog and they have like a huge, they have a long snout, right? Right? That's because they have more room for receptors. More surface area for receptors. So humans have about 10 million uh, olfactory receptors, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, dogs have 1 billion on average. On, that's on average, right? So some dogs have longer snouts than others, obviously, right? Uh, 10, 1 billion. 10 million to 1 billion. That's why they can smell better than us. Get yourself more olfactory receptors and you'll be a better sniffer, okay? Here's the thing though, we can, we, we humans, can detect one trillion different kinds of odors and being able to separate them, like discriminatively. But the problem is that we don't have enough words to verbalize all those differences. <laughs> yeah, um... And we're not very good at identification after that. So we can discriminate one trillion different odors, and I mean different odors, but being able to describe them and differentiate them verbally and other tasks, um, we can't, we, we suck at. We're basically guessing. Here's Ollie again. Hello, class. Hello, class. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, what is your favorite smell? Uh, chicken nuggets. Chicken nuggets? All right. Uh, any sp particular kind of chicken nuggets? Uh, chicken tenders. Chicken tenders? Is that because you just ate one? Yes. Yeah. All right, well, I was just curious what your favorite your favorite smell is. Where'd you go? Oh. Uh, what? What? What's your favorite smell? Like, what, what brings you immense amounts of joy? What? Bacon. Bacon. Now that's that's a good choice. Yeah, buddy. Woo! Woo! <laughs> All right, get on out of here. Mm. Goodbye. <laughs> Thank you, Daddy. Oh, ow! Sorry. Go, 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 go. Uh, t some technical difficulties here as I reset my whole system. <laughs> he almost yanked out my head and um, almost broke that. I think we're good on that one. I think we're good on that one. Okay. All right, then. Oh. All right. Good times. All right. Good stuff. That's going to be on the recording. Great. Great. All right. So, we have all of these. Uh, we have one, 10, 10 billion olfactory uh, receptors, and we can detect one trillion dollars. Uh, no, uh, smells. But we do suck at it. We 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 do we do suck at it. Um partly the reason that researchers have determined is that we don't really have a smell vocabulary. We don't have a smell like lexicon. We don't have like a lexicon devoted to just smells. Sure, we have a few things like, mmm, that's smelly, or, um, that's putrid, or, mucus. And, and honestly, putrid has a particular definition. So the smell putrid indicates the smell of rotting flesh, right? So that's what, that's what putrid is. And then we have things like maybe sulfuric, um, um, for like rotten egg kind of smell, uh, or flowery, but even flowery kind of is super ambiguous. Like what kind of flowers? Are they roses? Are they tulips? Are, is it lavender? You know, um, so we don't really have a good lexicon for for smells that like oh yeah that's that helps identify this one out of one tr trillion right um the other reason that researchers have determined the that smelling is so hard for humans is because the molecules have similar structures but smell different okay or have different structures and smell the same your wife keeps buffering. Oh no, I'm so sorry for her. her. It's such a bummer. <clears throat> Hope she gets that fixed. Poor wife. <laughs> oh, okay. Good times. So, an example of the second point is um, this chemical compound. Uh, which is organic, okay? Uh, this has been identified as the musk smell, right? Now, when I say musk, what do you all think about? What do you think about when I say the word musk? What is musky? And again, this will speak to the first point that I made, the first bullet point that's on the slide there. What do you think about when I say musk? Okay. Like something is musky, or that person has an interesting musk. 
male body odor. The smell of the wardrobe in Narnia. Are you mean? Don't you mean the wardrobe that takes you to Narnia? Come on, Jacob. The smell of fur. Hmm. Okay. It's interesting one. Like a stale air kind of smell. Do you, I, I, I think I've already made that point. <laughs> uh, f four people, four different answers. Uh, remember how I said that we like don't have a very good lexicon for smell words? <laughs> Oh look, there's there's a, a a stale smell. There we go. There's some, there's a duplicate. Well, in uh, <laughs> no, not necessarily, Jacob. No, we don't know if there were fur coats in the wardrobe in Narnia. It's quite presumptuous of you, I think. But here's this chemical, um, and so Musk has this double bond with, uh, this carbon has a double bond with oxygen and then a, um, CH3 group, a methyl group. I believe that's methyl. Um, somebody who, uh, knows more about chemistry can, can correct me on that one if, 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 if not. Um, <clears throat> Emma. <clears throat> um, but then we have, uh, this thing, right? So we have the, uh, this, this main organic structure of carbon backbone here with the CH2, but the same methyl group. Um, and this, this produces no odor. So same, similar structure, smell different. And then we have these two, this organic compound and this organic compound that both smell like pineapple. Right? So... You know. Now, there have been links between the structure of these molecules and the the olfactory quality of them, so what the odor tends to be, as well as then the act pattern of activation. And so here we have a, a typical breakfast scene. You know how Ollie was just saying bacon? He was like reading my mind, right? But when you have coffee and then we have OJ and all of this stuff is wafting up into this person and they're like, mmm, coffee. And then they're like, mmm, bacon. And then they're like, mmm, OJ, where's the champagne? You know, that sort of thing, right? Um, we're talking hundreds of molecules that make up all three of these different smells, and yet we can separate them. We're like, that's coffee, that's OJ, that's bacon, right? As they all come into our nose, and we're like, a la Homer Simpson, okay? So how does this work? What is, what is the deal with the smell? Okay, so up in your nose, up in your nose, top, click, 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 um, through your nasal cavity, at the, at pretty much all around your nasal cavity, but mostly in the top, mostly in the top, you have this structure here, okay? And so the layers are, are, are pretty cool. The layers are pretty cool. So you, l let's go from the bottom. So this is in the air. These are... Um, these olfactory receptors are neurons that have receptor sites dangling into the, um, dangling into the vacuum that is your nose, that, that is your navel ca cavity. They're like little fingers. And they're like, ooh, that's a smell, that's a smell, that's a smell, that's a smell. Mm -mm -mm -mm. And so, when a smell hits those receptor sites... It sends the, the action potential up through the cell and into the um, olfactory bulb. And I'll talk about the olfactory bulb in just a second. Um, and on these receptor sites are basically lock and key molecule um, places, right? So a triangle is going to go here, a circle is going to go here. And 
you have these all over your nose for all different kinds of smells, right? Um, 350 types of recept receptors to handle one trillion smells, right? Um, so it, it's few receptors for a lot of smells, but they all then start to converge. They go through the, uh, the, this bone structure of your, uh, skull, right? So the, the, uh, basically the suborbital bone essentially, and then other parts of, of the skull, uh, up into the olfactory bulb, okay? The olfactory bulb. And this, the olfactory bulb, is j just gently sitting underneath the brain. Just gently sitting underneath the brain. So this white space right here, this white space, that's where your brain is, actually. That's where your brain is, okay? Okay. Um, so to reiterate, we've got the ORNs, which are the olfactory receptor neurons. They go up into the, um, olfactory bulb and the olfactory bulb collects those in what are called glomeruli. Glomeruli. Uh, so that's multiple glomeruluses, right? So one convergence of all of these smells is called a, gl uh, uh, a glomerulus. And so the olfactory bulb is essentially just a, 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 a giant network of glomeruli. Okay. And the olfactory bulb heads directly into uh, your brain. It's the only sense uh, sensory organ that does not go to the thalamus before going somewhere else. It is the only one that goes directly to higher cortical, uh, higher cortical areas. Those include your hippocampus, your amygdala, and immediately to the frontal lobes. Okay. Pretty cool, right? That's pretty cool. I think that's pretty cool. We're not very good at it, but I think it's pretty cool. Um... So how you determine? So th th this is a pretty cool thing um, for ORNs and and how each ORN, the olfactory receiving neurons or recept uh, receptory neurons, receptory <laughs> receptor, um, you can use um, calcium to determine what smells they are actually responding to. So you can sort of break them up and see, okay, this is the kind of molecule that this ORN responds to, and this is the kind of molecule that this ORN responds to, and you sort of break them up in um, in groups, right? Because again, we're talking about 350 types that have been identified for one trillion uh, different kinds of odors, right? So we we're, they're essentially, they operate in molecular groups, okay? Um, and you can permanently damage your olfaction. I don't know if I have this anywhere in the slides, but you can permanently damage your olfaction by inhaling the wrong substance. Um, by something that will like literally shrivel the ORN up and then you can damage your sense of smell for that particular molecular group. Again, 350 for 1 trillion. So if you damage 300 uh, if you damage one of that 350, then you lose a subset of odors that you can detect. And if you damage more of that 350, let's say you damage 50 of them, you only have 300 types, uh, 300 ORNs now. You lose a gigantic subset of that, um, of that trillion, okay? So calcium, calcium was used to determine what groups um, detect which chemicals, right? Um, and then uh, you use neuron fluorescence, f neuron fluoresce. I think that's supposed to be fluorescence in that second bullet. I just stopped typing. <laughs> neuron fluoresce. Oh no, it's a verb. No, I'm good. All right, I just didn't read that fast. Fa uh, uh, I just didn't read that right. That makes the neuron fluoresce. Okay. So then you can determine the chemicals um, regarding. And so I think this is, um, 
Yeah, 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 yeah. There, yeah. So this is a, a breakdown of the kinds of smells that some of the receptors do. So uh, olfactory receptors, they have numbers, and then so this group responds to octanoic acid, which looks like this. No, nonoic acid, these respond to it, and it looks like this, although it looks almost the exact same. Octanol over here, bro, bromohexanoic acid. Ooh, sounds very broy. Um, and then bromooctanoic acid over here. I guess they have bromine attached to them. Kuhlman. Oh, I see. There's another. Oh, okay, there's another bond there. That's why. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six. Aha! I know organic chemistry now. No, I don't. Um, don't at me. Uh, okay. So, this is how you code. So, doing that calcium technique then allows you to code which olfactory receptor neuron responds to which area in the glomerulus. And you have identified which sets of olfactory receptors respond to different smells. Like this study with um, these... Um, different acids, right? Any questions about that? What's your favorite smell? Leave it in the chat, I'm curious. Curious or curious, what's your favorite smell? Cotton candy, mm, lilac, I like it. All right, so keep keep going. I'll I'll, I'll report them as I see them. Um, apple pie, smoke. What the hell, Jacob? What kind of smoke? <laughs> so the glomeruli in the olfactory bulb are the ones that are receive the the message. As I said, um, one or two glomeruli is all it takes for a receptor to send that information, and then like a that co gas gas gasoline, deed. Remember when I said about certain smells damaging your, um, your brain slash olfaction? Gasoline is one of them. Please stop smelling gasoline. Vanilla, fresh fruits and flowers, lavenders, chocolate, freezer, freezer smell. The restaurant subway, the smell inside the restaurant. Okay did not think this was going to devolve into um, my strange addiction. Smoke because it reminds me of s'mores. So like actual burning of a campfire. So fire smoke. Frankincense. the un That unique smell of Sam's Club. I, I literally don't know what you're talking about. Jacob, campfire smoke. Okay, well, that's where you gotta be more specific, my friend. Because cigarette smoke is still smoke, and yet smells awful, according to me. Um, so, you know. Okay. Just very ba basically, once we've determined what smells activate which ORNs, you can also use a couple of techniques to identify which glomeruli are activated by those ORNs, and so there's optical imaging and 2DG techniques, which is 2-deoxyglucose. We're not going to go into that. I just wanted to mention that we, while we suck at smelling, while humans suck at smelling, we're actually very good at identifying all of this um, information, even though, uh, or like scientifically, and through um, clever, clever techniques. Because we're we're dealing with chemicals and and because chemistry is the way that it is, we can we can do these techniques with them. It still doesn't make us any better at detecting the smells as like regular humans. Of course, of course not. Um, so here's the optical imaging technique: cortical cells consume oxygen when they're activated. Okay, as um, you may be aware. Okay, most. Most uh, most cells consume oxygen when they are activated. Uh, and a red light is used to determine the amount of oxygen in cells. Uh, that's why uh, when you put on a um, pulse oximeter uh, on your finger, it's a red light. 
Less oxygen reflects less red light. That's a pretty interesting property of um, oxygen. And then so you measure the amount of light reflected in which areas of the cortex are most active. It's pretty cool. And then you can do literally map the um, olfactory connections um, to those places in the in the cortex, right? Um, 2DG, again, I'm not going to ask you any questions about these two techniques. I just wanted to share with you what they were. Uh, so 2-deoxyglucose, um, so 2-DG contains glucose, which is sugar, right? Um, and then you expose that, uh, uh, animal that has 2DG in their blood with different chemicals. And, um, the thing about 2DG is that it's radioactive. It's a radioactive isotope. It's not dangerous. Um, like it's not ionizing radiation. It, but it still has a radioactive signature. And so you can then test because cells consume oxygen when they're active and they also consume sugar when they're active bada bing bada boom we're done you know what's the powerhouse of the cell uh whoever gets there first whoever gets there first vip status on the channel what all right moving on Anya, there you go, VIP status. Yep. All right, yep, Anya won. That's a bummer, everyone. You weren't you? Weren't I guess your mitochondria weren't working fast enough. <laughs> uh, okay, so olfactory signals they go to different parts of your brain because they don't go to the thalamus they can immediately go to the various parts that i've talked about right so we go from the olfactory mucosa uh to the olfactory bulb okay that's we're still sort of we're, we're not no i mean we're not in the nose anymore but we're just above the nasal cavity right and then it goes to the um piriform cortex which is Technically, the primary receiving uh, area, which is uh, essentially the um, inferior part of the temporal lobes, okay? And then it'll go to the orbital frontal cortex, which is back up here, which is um, basically the frontal cortex underneath, or, well, I should say, over your eyes. Um, so it's like right here, orbital frontal cortex, because this is your orbital bone, okay? So it's just sitting right there. Um but you can see here that all of these have connections with the amygdala. Okay. The amygdala. Oh, I'm sorry, Hunter. Capitalization doesn't matter. <laughs> so, this is why you, when you smell a smell, you get really happy. And when you smell another kind of smell, you get really angry. And then when you smell another smell, you're like, oh my god, I'm so sad. So what smells make you sad? What smells make you sad? Let me know in chat what, what smells make you the saddest mf -er on the planet. Okay. Um, uh, what else do I want to say about... Because we were running out of time. Running out of time. Yeah, okay. A couple more, couple more slides. Uh, Raniker, I just want to share uh, with Raniker here, multiple electrodes to detect neural responding. So here's the electrode placement mapping on the piriform cortex. And then they uh, expose the person to ice, or the, actually it wasn't the person, it was an animal, to an isoamyl acetate, okay? Um, and so you can see then this is the pattern of activation. And so based on this, we can say that um, this area of the cortex, this red area of the cortex, is where isoamyl acetate is. <laughs> I love how Katie said the smell of Subway um, is, the, is a smell that makes her sad, where Emmeline was like, man, that smell is the best. <laughs> <laughs> The, the 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 duck's position is amazing. Hospital smell, yeah. That um, sterile disinfectant smell, very sad. Uh, and so the last thing is another uh, another 
study by Wilson. Wilson, rats, piriform cortex. Again, um, here we have a rose uh, by any other name would smell as sweet, right? Because rose has nothing to do with its smell. That's what Shakespeare is trying to say. Um, so we have five smells, five odorants that come off that rose. Um, goes into the olfactory bulb. Okay, so that's chemotopic. The chemotopic map, the, the, sm the odorants... The odorant's uh, molecular profiles. Then it gets um, to the piriform cortex and activates all of this stuff. But then a pattern is activated and it's like the rat's like, Oh yeah, no, that's a rose, man. That's a rose. My name is, my name is uh, Remy and I'm a bomb cook. Ratatouille. Yeah. Kids don't like ratatouille for some reason. So... So the results show that with enough exposure, so if you keep smelling the same thing, then the piriform cortex will develop um, patterns. And so the smells that we smell a lot are the ones that get patterns. They're the ones that have a strong association with the amygdala. The amygdala is active and um, we have positive memories. I don't see enough bad smell things on, uh, in, uh, only five people said things about the uh, smells that make them sad. Trust me, smells are about the only thing you have instigating all of your memories. That's how it works. That's how it works. Don't ask me, I'm just the guy who's telling you how it works. It's just how it works. Um, so keep telling me who, uh, th what smells make you sad. Or, no, better yet, better yet. I want you to tell me what smells make you so angry that you're just like, I want to rage right now. Perhaps rage against the machine. I don't know. <laughs> Litter box. <laughs> uh, good old ammonia. Cigarette smoke makes you rage. Menthol cigarette smoke. Yeah. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Get a taste of that menthol cigarette. So smooth going down. Man, a lot of a lot of hate for cigarette smoke. Okay, some, some cannabis smell. All right, all right. Mm -mm. Cannabis smell makes me giggle. Um, smell of corned beef and cabbage when your mom makes it. it makes you rage. You're like, oh, mom, I don't want to eat that. Oh, I'm so angry. The dish room where I used to work. The weedy beer smell. Oh, what? That is so yummy and so delicious. Why does it make you so angry? Blue cheese. Uh, I'm a smoker and I'm sitting next to Anya. Uh, can I get me a blue cheese salad, please? Anya, do you like blue cheese in this cigarette? Oh my gosh, it's gonna be amazing. Mm, this blue cheese salad. <laughs> oh. oh, I'm so sorry, Stephanie. Yeah, cauliflower is the worst. Um. Oh, yeah. All right, everyone. I think that's going to be it for today. <laughs>